Okay, hello, and uh, and welcome to the event. My great, great privilege, actually, to introduce our speaker. Um, I've known James, or I first met James a couple of years ago, and James is pretty much the Java rock star. You hear about Java rock stars, uh, but he's not a traditional Java rock star. He's actually one of the nicest, most humblest people you will meet. Um, James Gosling, he's probably... Maybe, maybe I did insult myself, yeah. Um, James Gosling, probably more famous than Ryan Gosling, um, but, uh, but everyone still wants their, his autograph, photograph, everything like that. I think my claim to fame with you, James, was about two weeks ago, pretty much, pretty much at this time, two weeks ago, in San Francisco, community keynote. I was, I was there like this, and, and you were on, on the keynote stage doing the, uh, doing the forced choke as Darth Coder on me. That's my, I can die happy now that that's happened. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to block that, that, yeah, that, that event that, out of my memory. That, that was tough. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, here I've been asked to introduce the person in Java that really needs no introduction. So uh, without further ado, please give the father of Java, James Gosling, a big round of applause. So welcome, James. This session is very much going to be Q&A based. Okay, there's not going to be a presentation. You have direct access to one of the greatest minds that created Java. Um, so do think about questions. If anyone has any questions now, put their hands up. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get started. Um, I'll ask one question, then, then I'll jump straight to you at the back. Um, so my first question then, Java obviously over 20 years old now. Um, as your brainchild over 20 years ago, how has Java today lived up to your imagination, your, your vision 20 years ago? I, that's a, a crazy question because, you know, there's, there's just no way that 20, 25 years ago, you know, I thought anything like this would be happening. And, you know, when, when Java started 25 years ago, um, you know, it was just me. Right, and now there's a cast of thousands, and if you look at the at the at the crew that's that's working on developing Java right now, it's a lot of really really talented people, and you know they've done a lot of really really cool work, and you know I I, I, I every now and then I talk to Brian Getz about how about value classes are doing, and it's like okay Brian, so now you're on the, your seventh PhD thesis, you know, and you know. It's, it's been amazing. So, so 25 years ago, it was more of an idea than just something that you thought might be useful rather than a language which you saw is actually going to change the way we developers think about their platform and how they work? Um, yeah, I mean, 25 years ago, what we were doing was um, going around and talking to people who built cell phones and elevators and locomotives and VCRs and televisions, then they all had software in them and trying to find out what their issues were and, and then try, and then because we were, you know, really convinced that, that the whole, you know, escape from the data center was happening for real and the computer industry wasn't really paying attention. And the, 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 the you know, as soon as you get into something that's not just you know, data centers doing, you know, ATM machines and paychecks, that it gets to be a very different beast. Okay, so I'm going to take some questions from the audience now. There was one at the back. If anyone else has any questions, do raise your hand so I can, uh, I can check you. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your keynote that, that, you, that Java was, was very good for sort of AI or can be very good for AI. I just wondered if you could expound a little more on that by what you meant by that? Um, what I meant by that is, is more, I mean, in some sense it was a pretty simplistic comment because if you look at a lot of the languages that are commonly associated with AI like Lisp, um, the thing that really makes them work for AI is garbage collection. And, and you know, when you're doing AI kind of things, you end up building large complex data structures that um, are somewhat unpredictable. And, and you know, managing the storage and reclamation of those as you do the, the, the analysis of the situation 
um, can get really, really difficult. And if you're trying to do that kind of thing in C, it gets really, really difficult. And in the you know languages that have like reference count garbage collectors, they're they're pretty much a recipe for disaster, because you are going to get rings and you are going to get 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 escapes. Um, so it's 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 you know in my case. You know, I mean, probably the most interesting code I've ever written in my life is the code that does collision avoidance. You know, and it has to maintain a, a you know a fairly interesting model of the situation around it, you know, because there are always you know multiple possible colliders. Um, you know, you've got a mission you're trying to accomplish and goals to get to, and the goals may be vaguely defined, and you have to sort out you know all the different goals and all the different things that impact those goals, and then come up with, okay, I'm gonna go in that direction right now. Um, and, yeah, I mean, really, you know, the collision avoidance is literally like 40 lines of code um, that took me months to write. But it was a lot of fun and a lot of simulation. But, you know, it, 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 that, that, that sort of thing comes out pretty, pretty easily. Uh, hi. Uh, when you initially designed Java and the API specifications, you, you thought long and hard about it. You put in Unicode when Unicode wasn't around a lot. It was vo very fun. Yeah, I got a lot of hate mail about, about Unicode. Um, and then, of course, now that Unicode is 32 bits, it's like, ah, oh, geez. <laughs> Maybe it should have been UTF-8 under the sheets. but. And, uh, but one of the aspects was uh, a GUI aspect, and it just seems like the whole Java community has forsaken the GUI and the portability and applets have been dropped. You can't really draw anything on a web interface and you, you can't access iOS or anything like that. Why, why have they given up on the GUI side? Can you shed light uh, on that? I, um, personally, I think the people making those calls are complete fucking idiots. Um, but, you know, you know, that's, you know, what can I say? Um, you know, people have gotten very religious about, you know, building UIs on the web, and they think that you can do anything with, with the web. And you can do a lot with the web, but there are a lot of things you just can't do. Um, and, you know, I was really encouraged early on with Oracle's, you know, support of JavaFX. Um, and then they did this complete abandonware pivot off of JavaFX onto this jet thing that makes no sense at all to me. Um, you know, when technical decisions are made by, you know, management at the top, when all of the engineers working for them disagree with them, you know, you just gotta wonder. But, that's where the community has really been nice, right? The, the JavaX, JavaFX community has been um, somewhat driven uh, underground, but they're remarkably strong. Um, where I am, we're doing a lot of JavaFX development. It works great. Um, you know, the, you, you made a comment about iOS, and the, the problem with iOS has, was not at all technical. It was entirely a, a decision that Apple made in their terms of service. Um, they, you know, if you read the Apple terms of service, um, you can't do most of the comp compilation tricks that, that the Java VM does, or that the, the Chrome JavaScript compiler does. Um, you know, so that when you there are There are uh, projects in C Sharp that do they ditch the VM and they compile to Objective-C and it's sort of like a, a, a transpiler, but it is possible. Yeah, and there are like, like, like half a dozen projects that, have, that, that do that with, um, with Java. And uh, you know, the Oracle guys kind of at the last moment stuffed in an, uh, an ahead of time compiler for, for, the J, for, for, for JDK 9. Um, 
and that is pretty much entirely motivated by, by the iOS issue and the, their, their license terms of service. Um, you know, you lose all, almost all dynamic linking, or at least dynamic linking with any kind of performance. Um, you know, so it gets, it gets, it gets kind of tough. Um, there are a number of other folks that do it. There's a, there's a company called Gluon. I think they're in Belgium. They have a nice little, they have a really nice little system that packages Java apps for iOS and Android. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's sort of a difficult world when it's, when it's all sort of being beaten up by the, by the web religion. You touched on community earlier. Um, how important do you think communities like the LJC, like other user groups are to Java, and uh, what kind of impact do they have? Um, the, the, the impact of the community has been huge, particularly under Oracle. I mean, it was a big deal for us at Sun. Um, you know, uh, you know the. You know, for me, one of the, 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 the big deals with, with going out and visiting customers and doing, um, you know, community events was always that it, it was hard to know what to do, right? It was hard to know what people actually needed to solve their real problems, as opposed to having, you know, some out-of-touch manager sitting on a, you know, 20th-story office going, I think I'll do that, and then saying, then having, you know, directing the marketeers to sell that. Um, and, and there have been a bunch of spectacular examples lately of the community really making a difference. You know, so the, the, the rather dramatic outcry over uh, Java EE, where Oracle was trying to take it private, or the, the outcry over NetBeans, which I, you know, you know, Given how much you know, sweat and blood I've been I've put into NetBeans over the years, you know that's been that was just that was just wonderful, and you know the core Java platform, which Oracle is, you know that's the piece that Oracle is doing the best job of supporting, um, if only because they figured out that they would absolutely be dead without it. Um, getting getting you know feedback from the community um, is a really really big deal for them. And, and, it, and it's sort of two pieces, right? It, you know, part of it is, um, you know, the, the, the technical input on, you know, what's good and what's bad. And, but, you know, the most important thing ends up being essentially the economic impact on, you know, because almost all the people in the, in the, in the, in the, the developer communities have fairly influential positions at their employers and, and they have a pretty significant say on, you know, where the money gets spent. And, and tragically, that's really the only metric that, that Oracle pays attention to. Um, you know, none of the, you know, the, you know, at Sun we used to have like a zillion uh, metrics on customer satisfaction. And I remember this one rather annoying meeting where a, a certain unnamed senior Oracle executive said, well, we can get rid of all of that. None of that matters. The only metric Oracle cares about is, is whether or not they sign the check. Um, and, you know, it's tragically true. You know, so, so you know, you, 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 you all have wallets and, and, and you, you basically buy votes. That's kind of the way it works with them. Um, you know, so make sure that if your Oracle salesman shows up, you know, twist their arm until they get dislocated. So my question was, um, what do you think about the way that uh, Java is, the direction that Java is heading in at the moment, um, with respect to the modernization and also, um, the, you know, some of the newer stuff that they're doing to generics? Um, I, I'm basically really happy with uh, the way that the core Java evolution is happening. Um, you know, a lot of it has been you know, some really hard problems. You know, so, so for instance, like in, in JDK 7, the inclusion of lambdas. And it's like, well, why weren't lambdas in there before? They seem like so obvious. 
Well, yeah, lambdas have been obvious for a really, really long time. But if you try to do lambdas with no apologies about performance, then it becomes really difficult. Um, you know, lots of systems have had lambdas, and you know, you talk to you know authorities and programming languages, and it just turns into a big food fight because you know this style is better than that style is better than the other style, and you know I don't know how many you know SIG plan uh, conferences I've been to where you know they get these 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 religious debates about how to do lambdas, and convergence has really been hard. And, and I can't actually say that there has been any really convergence, any real convergence, but um, in figuring out how to do lambdas so that, for instance, if you use, you know, for each iterators over col collections, it is at least as fast as using a regular for loop or a sort of hand coding it. You know, if you look at what some of the folks have been doing, um, you know, with the, the kind of inlining tricks that the optimizers do. It's, it's pretty freaking amazing, because all the, all the hard parts are, are not in the specification of what the semantics of things like Lambda should be, but how to make it so that it's clean and accurate. And, and so like in, in, in JDK 10, I guess it's 10, the, the, the one that has been, you know, at the top of my wish list forever is value classes. And um, I remember Brian Getz coming to me like two years ago saying, okay, we're really going to do value classes this time. He said, how hard do you think it would be? And I'd spent a lot of time on value classes. And I said, well, half a dozen PhD theses. And... And, and, he, and he said to me, oh, no, no, it's only a couple of PhD theses. <laughs> and, 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 and not too many months ago, he came back to me and he said, well, James, you were the optimist. Because <laughs> I think they're going to end up at somewhere near, near a dozen you know, things that should have been somebody's PhD thesis topic. W would you uh, position value types or value classes above anything that's in JDK 9 now? Jigsaw? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I would, if only because as an intellectually difficult thing to do well, it's, it's, it's been a shimmery, scary thing for a really long time. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just intellectually hard. And the intellectual hard part is not specifying what the semantics of value classes should be but how you do the underlying performance optimizations so that they're really fast, right? So that if you do something like you specify like, you know, two-dimensional points or three-dimensional points or, or um, complex numbers or something like that, that, you know, there's no storage allocated. They're never written to the stack. They're only kept in registers. The, you know, they, 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 they never really exist other than in, in some AST somewhere. And that the, that the, all the, you know, the, the, the calculations just fly. Um, because the, the, one of the things that's always been a, a, a big deal for me, for, for Java, is being as close to the, um, kind of ease of use and intellectual integrity of a lot of the, 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 the sort of fancy high-level languages, but without or with as few apologies about performance as possible. So like in, 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 in JDK 9, the big thing is modules. And, and we've taken many runs at modules. And the problem with modules isn't modules so much, but, as in, but it's, it's how do you take advantage of them? How do you make them clean? How do you make them simple? Um, and you know, we've, you know, modules have been on the list for like every, for like like the last five or six JDKs, but they've always like fallen off because really exploiting them has turned out to be hard. And and so at at, at you know by the time JDK nine came around, it's like, you know, they all everybody said yes, we have to do this. You know, if only because Corba must die. Where, where did OSGI go wrong? 
Huh? Where did OSGI go wrong? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, it was, you know, the open systems gateway initiative, right? It was this whole thing designed to do something else. And, you know, there's this like little slice of it that really got used. And, and, and it, it, you know, for me, the OSGI was just too complicated for what it, what it does. Um, but, you know, that's not an argument to have with me. <laughs> um, I just, I always just like run screaming when that argument shows up. Um, because like, like people often complain about how big and clunky the, the, some of the Java libraries have become. And then they say, oh, but why didn't you just import all of OSGI, right? Which would have been like humongous and clunky. So it's like, please make up your mind. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts on the future of Java EE and the implication uh, that concerning neurization technologies such as Docker will have on it. Um, well, I've been having a lot of fun with, with Docker. Um, and I'm and I'm hoping that eventually EE can start taking advantage of the of, of things like modular modularization and and containerization. Um, one of the biggest issues that 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 Java EE has is that it's a big thing. You know, if you look at the at the at the full up Java EE spec, it's it's got everything in it and you know you might think that you know it really should have been done as as like a series of independent apis and i, and I think any sensible person would probably have done it that way except that um y you know the the welding together of all of these pieces became a uh you know kind of a marketing thing right it was like completely under out of the hands of the engineers um and if you look at how it was actually built, it's a bunch of independent APIs. Um, but from a marketing point of view, they're kind of welded together. And um, and I'd hope that it, you know, that that that, that eventually that can be, you know, better modularized. Um, so there's 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 less linkage between them. And there really, you know, in actual fact, isn't a lot. Um, but just as a matter of packaging. It's gotten kind of out of control, right? So that uh, you know, now that there's there's like two versions of Java EE, it's like the the web profile and the all the exotic stuff that only like five percent of the universe uses. Um, except that I think that like ninety percent of the universe uses like one thing out of the full profile. Um, at least that's been my experience, right? Is that, is that I use almost nothing out of the full profile, but there's always something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he just reiterated my experience, right? I mean, that's, that's been kind of the, 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 the overall tragedy of the Java APIs is that, you know, you, 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 you try to pick something that isn't used by many people and it's only used by like like one or two percent of the applications out there. And you say, well, gee, only one percent of the people, like, only one percent of like developers are using it, right? But okay, so you got like, you know, ten million developers, whatever it is. You know, if you get rid of something that one percent use, you know, you got a hundred thousand really angry developers out there. Um, and so lots of exotic stuff just, just, just stays there. But the only thing that there's sort of wide agreement that you can get rid of is Corba. And things kind of trail off after that. Um, so next question. Yeah, yeah, so we were talking about language features. So what do you think about Scala and its approach on extending the language and you know, other languages built on top of the JVM in general? Um, I like them a lot. I mean, I think that the, the different languages, you know, ex exploring the other. For me, almost all of the magic, the real magic of Java is in the VM. Um, there are a lot of, you know, nice things about the about Java, the language. Um, 
And you know, all these languages come at, at things from, from sort of different ways. Um, you know, and I've done some projects in Scala and been, been pretty, pretty happy with it. I, my, and, and actually in the last project that I did in Scala, my, 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 my big issue with it, with it is that it, it really, really wants to allocate lots of objects. And so you, so, so if you're, if you're, if you know, it's, it's, it's sort of heap, heap churn heavy. Um, but other than that, it felt really, really good. Um, and, and I, I, I particularly like closure just because the, 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 um, sort of immutable object style has some really, really positive I impacts. I mean, it can be really hard to write in that style. Um, and if you try to do sort of immutable only objects in, 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 in Java, you can do it, right? Where you declare classes where every field is final. Um, you can get some really, really cool things out of that, you know, things around threading, um, I did one where the, the, the undo history was based on the fact that, the, the, that all objects were immutable. And so going back one level of undo was just like switching a pointer. Um, and you did all mutating by rewriting. Um, and, and it can work really, really, but, but, but a, lot of these, a lot of these end up having um, styles that people find hard. Right, so the, the, the you know, everything must be immutable style, um, I think is, is great. A lot of people try it and go, what? I don't know how to think that way. Um, for me, the most depressing thing about Scala is it's, you know, it's sort of built as a functional programming language and you can write really nice functional programs in Scala, but because it's, it's sort of got this, well, it can also be procedural too. Um, if you if you sort of randomly select Scala programs by you know grepping around on on GitHub, um, you find that most people end up using Scala as 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 Java with um, abbreviated syntax, and and don't really write functional code nearly as much as they could. Um, next question. So today, when when you sit down, you do some work. What's your environment like? Do, do you work from home? Do you work from a place? What tools do you use? Um, so let's see. I use NetBeans. Um, on our cloud side servers, we had been all Glassfish until clusterfucked. Um, and, and, and now we mostly use um, JBoss or Wildfly. And that's par that was partly motivated also by the fact that our, uh, we have a bunch of customers that have standardized on, on JBoss and they want to be able to run our software in their data centers. So JBoss kind of, kind of works well with, with a lot of them. Um, on the robot itself, um, it's the, the robot itself, its control system is a big bag of Java code. Uh, we use embedded Jetty for some of the con, con, control stuff. Um, we use a, you know, there are a bunch of libraries that we use, like, like there's, there's a library that I love called JTS. I don't know if anybody here has ever used JTS. It's the Java topology suite. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, take a, a, a detailed map of, of, you know, Europe and Asia and intersect it with the outline of a ship, you know, where the, you know, the map of Europe and Asia has like millions and millions of lines. Um, works great. It's a really nice package if you're doing that kind of stuff. Um, an awful lot of the maps you've ever seen are like JTS underneath them. Um, Let's see, we use Git for our um, source control, although we mostly don't use GitHub. There's a, there's, there's, there's a, a thing called Gitblit, which is kind of a, you know, if you want to run your own version of GitHub internally, 
And we do that mostly because it's, it's, that makes it easier to tie into other tools. We use Jira for bug tracking. Uh, we use Garrett for uh, managing check-ins and doing code reviews. Um, yeah, for, for debugging, I try to like run things on my laptop, but tragically, I think the debugging tool I use most often is Printlin. <laughs> um, it, is, it is sort of the tool of choice for too many desperate people. Um, uh, what else? Oh, I should stop. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, well, first, the, uh, I mean, I'm also on the print line side of things when it comes to debugging, so I think that's still very widespread. Um, my question, though, is about uh, do you have any specific um, thoughts about generics and particularly extending them um, and getting rid of erasures? My perception is that this uh, well, has been a prolonged process by the, well, whatever I should call it, transition from Sun to Oracle. Um, but, uh, I mean, is there any chance this process might be completed? And as one sort of a teaser, I think this might unlock a whole lot of wealth for things like object, well, or, well persistence, yeah, object relational mapping or whichever you want to call it, because at this point, erasers put a limit to that. Yeah. Um Long, nerdy debate. Um, I'm really the wrong person to have that debate with. Um, and, you know, f you know, fundamentally, you know, I agree that getting rid of, of erasures and doing it and sort of cleaning that up would be a really, really good thing. Um, you know, when we first did generics, the, the sort of overriding thing was to be able to do generics um, while maintaining, you know, sort of a, a smooth transition from the past, and 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 so how to do, and, and and actually several people have done some really nice proof of concepts of how to do erasures properly, and it, you know it's been on the list for a long time, but it's 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 been, um, it's on the on the on the important but not quite important enough list. So if I had to rank it to against like lambdas and value classes, eh, you know, I, value classes would absolutely make a big difference to me today. Um, but, you know, write letters to Brian Getz. Because right now he's kind of the, the, the lord of that. Um, but, and, and I'm sure that what he would say is, yes, we'll get there. And if somebody in the community was to do a really bang out job of implementing it, you know, you, 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 people would be really happy. Uh, next question. Uh, yeah. Uh, I usually used to have one doubt, yeah. Uh, has Java really lost its focus? Initially, we were thinking about machines. Java is written for the machines and things like that. Uh, we, I remember there used to be a project called Jenny, And then we moved all our focus to JEE and totally forgot about what Java was initially planned for. Are we coming back to the circle of Internet of Things? And what would have been your vision in those days of Internet of Things? Um, you know, the, the, the question of focus is always a, a hard one. You know, if, if you've got a task to do, you know, you can focus on it and just get it done. Um, when you've got a, a tool that people find useful for this and useful for that, and useful for the other thing, um, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain focus because you find that, you know, Java is not something that Sun or Oracle ever steered in any particular direction. You know, Java has always been something that um, was taken in strange places by the developer community. And, um, 
you know, a lot of that has been just like amazing to watch. You know, the, the apps that people have written are just like crazy. Um, but, you know, I, I, I personally just thought that Genie was the coolest thing ever. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like, like the, like, you know, it, it was one of these things that got caught up in a marketing war. You know, one of the problems with, with Genie is that it um, used some of the networking aspects of Java that were really hard to replicate in other languages. You know, so, so in particular, the way that you could do uh, uh, a remote method call, you know, you know in, in RMI has this really great feature where you can have a remote object, you do a remote method call, and or you you send an object to a, to a remote machine and say you know apply this method on it, but that the object that you just sent over is an object for which there is no cl no code on that machine, and then the machine will reach back and say give me the code for that, right? So people would do things like, um, you know, a really interesting cheap batch execution environment where you you would you would have a you know, the main program would essentially say, pull something out of the queue, and it's a queue of runnable objects, and then you just run the runnable object. And then, you know, some remote guy sticks a runnable object into the remote guy's queue, and then the code just kind of follows it. Really, really cool. You can do really powerful things with that, and Genie really exploited that. But um, that doesn't port to any other programming languages anywhere. Right, and, 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 and so that got, you know, I mean, it, it, it had this interoperability problem, and, you know, then, then, then outfits like, like, like Microsoft sort of, you know, start these, like, gigantic marketing campaigns, and, um, you know, it turns into, you know, when, 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 when API directions are, 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 you know, they turn into you know massive food fights in the in the in the commercial press. It, it's a little crazy, right? So so many of these things that you know like 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 SOA and XML they became overly politicized, um, and you know whatever, right? Um, my question is about. Uh you know, the latest uh, shift of technologies that is happening towards uh, these uh, JavaScript-based frameworks, and people are actually uh, considering them as, uh, you know, uh, main tools for their uh, web application development. So what's your take on that? And have you uh, had any experience with them? And if yes, so, so, so which, which frameworks? The JavaScript-based frameworks. Like, you know, the, there is a shift that is happening now, you know, like, uh, working on like Node.js or Express or these sort of things, people are shifting away to to these ones. So well, you know, so so I mean, you know, you can do a lot in JavaScript. Um, there's a lot you can't do in JavaScript. Um, you know, and you know, you know, one of the things that just annoys me to no end about JavaScript is that, you know, there exists a standard, but it's only kind of, you know, it's not very well adhered to. And even, you know, within one manufacturer's product, you know, if you, if you, if you try to make a piece of JavaScript run on every version of Internet Explorer, you're pretty much doomed. Um, and, and that actually ends up being one of the driving forces behind a lot of the, 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 the frameworks, because the frameworks um, hide a lot of the the, the, the rubbish that you get from, you know, version to version. Um, and, you know, it's hard to tell these days what is a framework and what isn't, you know. So, like, like probably the thing that's used the most um, is jQuery. And then there are a bunch of things that call themselves new frameworks, but they're just jQuery with window dressing. Um, and... You know, the, 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 there are just so freaking many JavaScript frameworks. It is completely impossible to have uh, any kind of, of sort of well-informed technical opinion, right? It, it, you know, it, it sort of, 
um, boils down to whatever has burned you the least, you know. And so I, I tend to I, I tend to just use you know jQuery, and two or three of the packages based on jQuery, and I stay away from the the fancy packages. Um, you know, a lot of the JavaScript on the server side is driven by people who don't know how to do anything other than JavaScript, so that saves them energy. And the, the, the problem with things like Node.js, it's really good if you're just doing simple things because it's got this like non-threaded, you know, sort of JavaScript-ish kind of model where you do simple things and you get simple answers. Um, but as soon as you cross over into more complex things to be done by the server, Node.js quick, quickly falls apart because you end up with these like state machine styles and um, things that JavaScript doesn't do very well. And, and for me, when I'm running website stuff, um, I mostly end up way out there in the, in the, in the complex land just, just starting, right? I'm, I'm never trying to, you know, populate a drop down list with, you know, a list of, you know, nearby stores. Um, I'm always trying to do something more complicated than that. Um. Uh, this is a bit of a more personal question, but as they call you the father of Java, um, having created something 25 years ago that is now taught in thousands of universities worldwide, used in millions of devices around the world, how does that make you feel on a personal level? As this is something that you wrote and how widely it's used and how widely it's taught? Um, personally, it's kind of a weird feeling. Um, you know, most places I can wander around and people ignore me. Um, I cannot go on vacation to India, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, and San Francisco is mostly okay because people are polite. Um, the really hard problem is, you know, when you have kids and, you know, you are responsible for the APCS course, right? Um, and, you know, they start out in APCS and all the other kids assume that you are like the best person ever because it's your dad, right? And it's like, no running away, screaming. Neither of my kids want to have anything to do with CS entirely because of me, even though I think they'd both be pretty good at it if they could just get over it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also something that, that um, from a technical work experience point of view, um, I kind of OD'd on it like a decade ago. Um, and, and I'm happy to do, be doing something else now. So, so, so now I'm a user instead of a producer, um, which is a really nice feeling too. It's like, oh yeah, that actually made sense. Um, and so that's been good. Uh, next question. Um, hi. Uh, some months ago there was this lawsuit between Google and, uh, um, and Oracle which seemed to be very damaging uh, on Java, I would have thought. But is, um, is Java safe within Oracle? Um, yeah, I mean, other than the, that, that stupid court case, it's, it's extremely safe, if only because like, almost all of the, Google, uh, the, of the Oracle technologies are based on it. And they know it, and it would kill them. Um, the, that that, that court case is just crazy, you know, and it's, 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 it's sort of an outgrowth of, of the fact that, that Oracle's a coin-operated machine and, you know, a bunch of lawyers are convinced that they can get a gigantic settlement pay, payout. And it's like, yeah, but it's stupid. It's harming the rest of the business. But, yeah, but, you know, it's just like these lawyers, they kind of go, but... I'm not responsible for that line, that, that line item. I've got my own line item. And it's like, it's just math, guys. But it's always, you know, line item local, you know, business, business line item local. And it's like, it's just crazy. I mean, I, 
makes zero sense. Um, other questions? Mike? Um, there's some features in Java, such as a class loader, um, which I think are way ahead of their time. And you couldn't possibly have conceived of all the usage of, of things like the class loader. Um, is there anything that you wrote very early on that you think is sort of understated? Um, well, I actually think that class loaders are still understated. I mean, the things you can do with class loaders are just like, ex just crazy. Um, the, the one that's, that's kind of in there is security managers. Um, there are a bunch of things you can do with security managers that I think people aren't, aren't doing yet. Um, and there are a bunch of things in class loaders I wish I could, you know, I would, you know, like, like, like I've, I've got this one bag of code right now that has this, this problem that I really, really, really want to be able to reach into a class loader and find out, find all the jar file artifacts, all the class file artifacts behind it, which you can't because people are often playing crazy games with class loaders, so there really isn't a class file behind them. But nonetheless, um, <sighs> sigh. But um, ones that are underappreciated. Security managers are kind of at the top of my list there, but um, I wish more people were playing with JavaFX. That is, that is a really, really cool library, and I've been having a lot of fun with it. And, and it's sort of, you know, I, has, has, has political problems, but um, very cool. Next question. B building on that, uh, you have mentioned things that you would like to see in Java in the future as soon as possible, like value classes. Um, but if we could look at things to remove or to break, even breaking backwards compatibility, what is the thing that you would like the most to change or to remove and because it would have the highest impact in the future of the language? Thank you. Um, I don't know about highest impact, but on my sort of annoying list of why did I do that was things like making switch statements be in the same style as C. I mean, that was just dumb. Um, I mean, it was a good idea in the sense that it, it, it sort of attracted a lot of developers, um, but it could have been done differently. Um, I still really miss... Um, has anybody here ever used Simula? Yeah, that one person. Okay. So I, I, I used to do a lot of work in Simula, and I loved the Simula inspect statement, which was... Um, a cross between a switch statement and instance of, and you could do some really interesting things with it. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I missed the, the with statement from Pascal. Um, you know, it's, it's, but it's, it, it's, 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 it, it's hard to know. I mean, y you can do some tricky things with the C style switch statement. And, and, I, and I have to admit to being one of the worst offenders. Um, yeah. You know, and then there's the sort of language things like, or sort of library things like AWT event handlers. What were we thinking? Um, next. Um, a lot of languages have uh, optional try-catches. Uh, what are your thoughts now on having forced try-catches? Um, so try-catches were like a really difficult debate. Uh, I did the first implementation of try-catch and they were not forced. They were completely optional. Um, because I was really nervous that, that there were a whole lot of classes that, or a whole lot of exceptions that were so ubiquitous that, that um, you would have to have try-catch statements everywhere, you know, if you, if you tried to do things like null pointer exception that way. Um, 
but this was a this was a point where where Bill Joy was like just jumping up and down like steamed up about and um, literally one night um, he and he and another engineer came in they um, they implemented the, the, the type checking on 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 on, on try catch and 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 went through the agonizing thing of breaking the exceptions down into the the the, the checked and unchecked categories, um, which when I came in that morning, kind of made me grumpy. I was really pissed off, and then it's like, you know, this actually works really well, because. You know, and and I, and and you know, when I said I, I I didn't like it, it was more it was more kind of an ambivalence, because you know one of the things that I'd always been really cranky about C with is that you know all kinds of things were returning error codes, right? Like you you know like, like the open system call you know returns an error code, and you have to check for those error codes everywhere. And one of the biggest sources of, of reliability problems in, in C code was just that people wouldn't check error wouldn't check error codes, and so when you make exceptions optional, um, people go, oh, I don't have to do that, right? And then, you know, the open system call fails, and you know, works great on my laptop because you know slash home slash user slash jag slash foobar is there. And, and the software works. What do you mean it doesn't work on your machine? Um, you know, you must be doing something wrong. And, and you know, by, by forcing people to pay attention to exceptions, and then, you know, it turns into this delicate judgment call about what things should be checked with exceptions and what shouldn't be. Um, but I think on whole it has worked out well. This is about JVM. Uh, you alluded about uh, you are um, um, near to the JVM earlier, and you like JVM languages, um, etc. So as a developer, we are more um, familiar with the Java and uh, syntax and, uh, and the business, um, and the cutting the code, etc. But we are not sure what JVM is is really all about and. Uh, what it really wants, and uh, when we are actually attaching to the JVM, um, some the various tools uh, say that actual tool itself is lying, and uh, what JVM is really un doing underlying, nobody knows. So the, the visibility to JVM is not there uh, to us. So in your point of view, um, what a developer should know or must know or J uh, about JVM and um, and what annoys you uh, from developer point of view? What are the things they are not considering um, JVM point of view, uh, so that JVM is happy uh, of what the developer has written and it is um, well written, well performant code as well. Um, so one of the design goals of the JVM is that you shouldn't have to pay any attention to it at all that the things it does for you um, are pretty much transparent. So, for example, um, you know, if, if you've got a big data center, you know, you didn't buy all the, all the machines in it all at the same time. So they've all got slightly different chips on them. Even if they're all Intel x86s and they're all running you know, Ubuntu 16.04, they're probably slightly different Intel chips. And, and the JVM ends up optimizing your code for exactly the chip that's on the box that the code is running on. And, and so you don't have to worry about, you know, compiling 12 versions of your optimized program to run on every flavor of Intel chip that happens to be in your data center and then going through the deployment nightmare of making sure that the right versions are run on the right chips. You just say, please run it for me, and the JVM does the right thing. Um, you know, same thing with things like, like garbage collection. You know, in, in earlier versions of Java, you used to have to 
do all kinds of tuning of JVM parameters. And these days, that's almost never makes any sense at all. Um, for some people, it makes a big difference, but um, you know, there, 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 there might be like two people in this room for whom that is actually important. Um, and for the rest of you, just trust that it's doing the right thing. Um, why, why no tail recursion optimization? And is there some reason why it's difficult or, or do you think it will happen at some point? Um, tail recursion optimization, um, the, the, the JVMs can do tail recursion optimization. They can, they might. It's just, you know, it's, it's, um, it not, it's not specified in the language that the optimizer must do tail recursion elimination. Um, and a lot of that has to do with interactions with things like, like debugging. Um, and, you know, the, the definition of stack traces. Um, what, what happens when something goes wrong and you get a stack trace that doesn't have any, everything in it. Um, sometimes VMs do do tail recursion elimination or the, 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 the equivalent of it, you know, complete inlining of stack frames happens. Um, the, the, but, but really the, the, the hard problem with tail, tail recursion elimination is not, you know, because the, the VM is free to do it, um, you know, so long as it doesn't muck up with semantics, right? So if debugging is turned off and yada, 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 the VMs can do it. Um, but if you try to write a language specification that says, under these circumstances, tail recursion elimination must happen, which is what some of the like, Lisp-like languages try to do, um, they, they end up with, with really contorted specs that tend to not make any sense, and they're essentially always wrong because they were right you know, in the implementation of five versions ago, but now they're wrong. Um, and, and, and um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a transparent, non-mandated thing, completely possible, um, and debugging is the usual thorn. Um, next question. Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, not very much about Java, but then uh, I want to know uh, what you think about the future of computing uh, as you see it. Uh, uh, you know, we, we have AI coming, uh, Internet of Things, and also quantum computing, which is uh, in the infant stages. And, uh, you know, we have this uh, revolutionary memory uh, chip coming out, the 3D uh, cross-point technology. So w w where do you see the future of computing is going to? You know, if, if, if I could see what the future of computing technology was going to be, I would be a really wealthy person. Um, you know, and, and I guess for me, the, the thing that's been, you know, I, I, I've, been, uh, I've been in this business for a really long time. You know, I, I actually earned these gray hairs the, the, the hard way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of been like, Every year it's like, oh, computing, it's just exploding. It, it has to slow down because there can't be anything else. And, you know, it's been in a constant state of explosion, you know, for too many decades. Um, I mean, I've actually been a, 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 uh, a been getting a, a, a paycheck as a software engineer for, 47 years. So that's a little frightening. And, and, and there's just no detectable slowdown. And, and I think it's just, damn. You know, the way you think about things changes every day. And one last question about, given that you've been father of Java for 20, 25 years, and you've created uh, probably the biggest programming language with the biggest ecosystem that the world has seen. 
What do you do after that? What excites you about your job? How, where do you go from that? And, and why, did you, why did you pick Liquid Robotics as your next venture? I, I, I get to go snorkeling with robots in the ocean. I mean, what, you, know, you know, I've never had a software job where, you know, one of the requirements was, you know, must be able to swim and snorkel. And, um, you know, what, you know, the fact that we've got an engineering site on the big island of Hawaii. And, you know, I did a lot of the, the vehicle dynamics, you know, the rudder control and that kind of stuff. So I spent hours and hours and hours swimming with robots. And, damn, <laughs> you know, what could get better? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned in your keynote speech this morning about uh, right ones run anywhere. Whether you had any horror stories, particularly maybe HP nonstop or IBM mainframe? Um, horror stories. Um, I, I guess my biggest horror story with the whole right once run anywhere thing was the early days of cell phones. Um, you know, because we worked really hard on making it such that, you know, your Java program could go from one place to another. And then you discover that the, the screens on all the cell phones are all so different that all the game manufacturers reauthor every piece of artwork for every screen, for every model of every cell phone, because you know the cal color calibration and pixel density of every screen was always different. And 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 so it's like, well, you know, you try to do the right thing, but you can't actually, you know, we didn't actually write a spec for color calibration. In the image in the in the graphics library, and and so every phone manufacturer did slightly different things, and then every person writing games was doing slightly different things. And these days, the only reason it's it's kind of okay, like in the Android world, is that there's only like two companies that make screens, so they're all you know reasonably consistent. And the sRGB model has kind of taken over the universe, so. Um, but you know, in the early days of cell phones, that was uh, that was really annoying. So, okay, that's that's actually the last question all the time we had uh, for this stage. Um, so please join me in giving a big round of applause and saying thank you to James Wilson. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.